Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to show you how to design some gRNAs that you can use with Cas9 to knock out a target gene. And in addition to that, I'm also going to show you how to design some oligos that will allow you to clone that gRNA sequence into a Cas9 expression plasmid. Uh, so before we get started, let's just review how Cas9 works because that's definitely important to this process. Uh, in our specific approach, we're going to design a Cas9 gRNA expression plasmid, shown here in the top left. Now what this plasmid does is after it's uh, transfected into the cell, it's going to express the Cas9 protein along with a fluorescent marker protein, just so we can be sure that the plasma made it into the cell, we can actually see the fluorescence there. Um, but when we get the uh, Cas9 protein, we also get expression of a gRNA, gRNA with its scaffold. So that would be what's shown over here on the right. So the gRNA binds to the Cas9. Then the Cas9 has a nuclear localization signal on it that allows it to be imported back into the nucleus. And what it's going to do there is it's going to seek out any target sequences that have a sequence that matches the gRNA sequence shown here. And when it finds that, it binds to that sequence and cuts it. And then the cell tries to repair that cut, but if it repairs it flawlessly, Cas9 cuts again, and inevitably Cas9 cuts, the cell repairs, Cas9 cuts, the cell repairs, the cell makes a mistake and either deletes a base or inserts a new base at that location, and we get a frame shift in the gene. And so that's hopefully something that uh, knocks out that gene, gives us a loss of function mutation, and that allows us to study the gene. So there you go, that's the overview of Cas9. And what we need to make all this work would be this gRNA sequence right here. So we need to be able to look into the genome, look at our gene, and select a gRNA that we can use to reliably direct Cas9 to cut in our gene. So how do you do that? Well, first things first, you have to know the sequence of your target gene. You have to know uh, the sequence, first of all, um, but you also, also have to know the structure. So where are the exons and introns? Uh, where's the start codon? Any signal peptides? 5' prime and 3' prime UTRs? Things like that. Because that's going to help direct you uh, to the best spot for your gRNAs. So for example, <clears throat> I would not want to mutate the UTRs because there's no codons there for the amino acids. Um, so I'm probably not going to have a very strong effect on gene expression if I mutate those UTRs. Uh, likewise, I don't want to cut inside of an intron. So I only want to be looking at exons. And I also probably want to avoid signal peptides if I can, just because uh, a mutation in those uh, is unlikely to influence the activity of the whole enzyme. Um, because those signal peptides are often cleaved uh, after processing. So anyways, uh, start by getting the sequence of your protein, and then one thing you can do, one way you can design gRNAs is manually. You can look at this sequence and then find the PAMs. Remember, the Cas9 protein starts binding DNA by binding to these PAM sequences. Every Cas enzyme has a different PAM. We're going to be using S. pyogenes Cas9, and the, and the PAM for that is an NGG. Now notice here I have listed both NGG and CCN. The PAM is NGG if it's on the coding strand, which is what's shown here at the top of the screen. But don't forget, there's another opposing strand that's also there. And so a CCN on the coding strand would be the NGG we're looking for on the opposing strand. So either one of these are acceptable PAMs. So what I do is I start looking through my gene for NGG or CCN. Here's an example of an NGG PAM. In this case, the N equals A, but I've got GG. Here's an example of a CCN PAM, where again, the N is A. Now notice here that I've selected PAMs that, only, that are only uh, two Gs. You wanna avoid PAMs that have more than two Gs because that can somewhat confuse the Cas9 enzyme because the presence of more Gs here on the right side um, might cause Cas9 to bind, let's say, one base off from where you'd like it to. So here, we've got a very specific spot where uh, Cas9 can bind to this PAM. It can't bind one base to the right, for example. 
So anyways, you want to look and find those NGG or CC in PAMs. Then you want to copy 20 bases that are on the 5 prime end of the PAM. Now this means different things depending on if you're using an NGG or a CCN PAM. If I'm using an NGG PAM, then the gRNA sequence is going to be to the left. That's the 5 prime end of the uh, NGG PAM. So 20 bases here is what I want to copy to the left of that PAM. If I'm using a CCN though, then it's 20 bases to the right because we're talking about that opposite strand, so the five prime ends on the other side. So this is would be the sequence you use for the gRNA for the CCN PAM. Also, notice here that I'm differentiating between the gRNA sequence and the PAM. You do not want to copy the PAM in your gRNA sequence. It will not work if the PAM is there. Okay, so once you have these sequences, you're probably going to get a multitude of them. There's going to be a lot of different potential gRNA sequences that you could use for this knockout experiment. So you have to check them, uh, refine them to pick the best one, or two, or three. The first thing you want to do is check these sequences, shown here in green, for any off-target binding in the genome. So you can use the BLAST tool to do that. You want to check the rest of the genome, see if there's any other targets that match perfectly, or maybe have one mismatch, two mismatches. Cas9 is pretty faithful, but it can make mistakes. So it's best if you only use gRNAs that have at least three mismatches in this gRNA sequence here. Once you've refined uh, with BLAST, then if, you've, if your gRNA uh, doesn't have any off-target sites, you want to also check the 5' prime end for the presence of a G. In this case, my, my gRNA already has a G, but if it did not, I would want to add one to the 5' prime end as an additional base. It doesn't have to match the target sequence, um, but the reason we put a G on the 5' prime end here is because the RNA polymerase 3, that enzyme that drives transcription of the gRNA, prefers to have a G as the first base it transcribes. So even if you don't have a G here, you want to add one, and that will give you more gRNA in your target cell. You also want to check within the sequence of the gRNA for runs of four or more Ts. Again, this is going back to the RNA polymerase 3 enzyme. If it encounters a run of four Ts, it falls off the template. It stops transcribing. So if you were to put some Ts in the gRNA sequence, uh, let's say five Ts, you would never get the full length gRNA in the cell. It would always be truncated to wherever those Ts are. So you wanna avoid any gRNAs that have that problem. In addition, just like any other uh, piece of DNA, you want to avoid stretches that have, you want to avoid sequences that have uh, greater than 30 to 80 percent GC content and that's just because G's and C's when there's a lot of them together uh, they can form some pretty uh, stubborn secondary structures that can get in the way of what you're trying to do so just make sure you're, you're within this window of 30 to 80 percent GC content on the same note you want to avoid secondary structures that uh, are inhibitory, so things that form hairpins, let's say. If the first half of this gRNA was all A's and the second half was all T's, uh, that's a sequence that could fold in on itself and bind to itself instead of the target sequence. And that's definitely something you want to avoid. And then last, but certainly not least, if you can, you should select a gRNA sequence that has an A or a T four bases upstream of the PAM. So for example, if I'm looking at this gRNA here on the right, it has a, let's see here, here's the PAM, one, two, three, four bases away from the PAM is an A. I would like to have uh, an A or a T here, so this is a pretty good gRNA, but you might have a C or a G there. If you have an A or a T in that location, then that will actually enhance binding of the gRNA by Cas9. Cas9 prefers to have an A or T in that position. Now, if you have a C or a G, that's not the end of the world. You can probably still run your experiment. However, if you are splitting hairs, trying to just choose between two very good gRNAs, this is something that might help you to decide. Okay, so 
there you go. You could go through all of these steps for every one of your target genes, look at all your different gRNAs, but it would be very difficult, right? There's a lot of different gRNA possibilities in this gene. I'm only showing two of them. Uh, so it would be a lot of work to do this manually. Instead, what you could do is go online. And there's a lot of web-based tools that can do all this work for you. I just wanted to show you that process so you understood how these algorithms work. Um, but just to give you two examples here, uh, Chop Chop is one that I use frequently and I know it very well, so I like to use it. Um, but there's also companies that sell Cas9 protein and synthetic RNAs like Synthago here. They offer their own uh, gRNA design tools as well. Uh, so different strokes for different folks. Um, you can use whatever you like best, um, but I like Chop Chop and that's the one we're going to go through uh, in this video. So I'm just gonna click on this link here. All right, so this is what the Chop Chop uh, webpage looks like. You wanna start by inputting your target gene. So in my case, it's IFNL1. I wanna look at interferon lambda one. I wanna look at the human version of that protein. I'm gonna be using Cas9 to knock it out. There's other variants of Cas9 that you can select here. And I'm gonna be doing a knockout experiment. You can also go a step further and select options down here. So let's go to the general tab first. What this allows you to do is tell Chop Chop where you would like Cas9 to cut your gene of interest. Uh, the most common selection would be in the coding region, so this is where the codons are. We definitely want to cut there because then we could mutate some of those amino acids or uh, completely abolish uh, translation of the protein. Um, but it also gives you the option to look at other exons as well, so you could cut in the uh, untranslated regions on either side of the uh, coding sequence. That's definitely an option. You can take out splice sites with gRNAs, so get rid of introns, things like that. Or you could cut in the promoter as well if you wanted to study the function of the promoter for this gene. Um, but we're going to go with the coding region for today. And there's a lot of other finer details that you can set down here as well, but they're uh, for the most part not important for what we're trying to do. Then on the Cas9 tab, we can select a few different things. So we can first of all select the length of the guide RNA. Uh, there's varying reports out there, but a guide RNA as short as 17 bases can also work. We're going to play it safe and go with 20. You can also select the specific PAM for your Cas9. So again, we're using S. pyogenes Cas, so the PAM is NGG, but there's some other ones that you could select here, or even input your own. And again, finer details down here, but we don't need to worry about those for now. This tab, the primers tab, also allows you to design some PCR primers that you can use after you've generated your mutation to copy the target site out of the genome and then send it off for sequencing. And so that's something you want to do because when you sequence that target site, you can see exactly what the mutation um, that Cas9 induced was. So did you induce a frame shift? Or maybe it was a silent mutation? Or maybe there was a large deletion? You don't know that until you sequence the genome. And so that's what this tab allows you to do. It designs some primers. So These would be uh, short oligonucleotides that bind on either side of your target site. And then you can use PCR to amplify all of the sequence between those primers. So uh, just in general, I like to get a larger uh, view of that sequence. So the default here might be 100 to 300. I increase that to 500 to 1,000 because I, I, li I like to see more of the gene. Um, you can also specify uh, where the target mutation site should be within that 500 to 1,000 bases. So down here, I choose at least a minimum distance of 50 base pairs from the end of that amplicon to my target site. But there you go, <clears throat> we specify that, and then we can scroll down here and click Find Target Sites. Now, depending on the time of day that you do this, there might be other users that are uh, using this uh, tool, and you might have to wait a little while. I did this earlier, so it's just popping right up for me. But anyways, let's look at this display that Chop Chop has uh, put up here for us. And what we see is the entire, trans or the entire gene here. So the blue blocks would be the exons, the red lines would be the introns in between. 
on these blue blocks, you can notice the first exon here has a very short 5 prime untranslated region. The start codon would be right here, where that uh, thicker blue block starts. And then we have more codons here in exon 2. And then we continue on to exon 3, 4, and 5. And notice here in exon 5, we also have a lengthy uh, 3 prime untranslated region as well. So there you go. Chop Chop gives you this nice uh, display to show you the structure of your gene. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that uh, some other genes might have what we call splice variants, um, where sometimes there's additional exons that are in the sequence uh, or in the final transcript, and Chop Chop will show you those as well. And if there's exons that occur in some splice variants and not others, you can actually tell it to avoid those, such that you make mutations only in exons that are conserved in all different splice variants. But anyways, that's just something you might see. You might see more than one of these lines here, uh, multiple blue blocks, for example, and that's what that is. It's different splice variants of your gene. Okay, so <clears throat> if we look down here, we can see that Chop Chop has generated dozens of different gRNAs uh, for our target gene. And then it's ranked them according to a few different factors. Uh, first of all, most importantly, it's put up top here uh, gRNAs that have zero mismatches, or targets it, that has no targets, sorry, that have no off targets in the genome with zero mismatches. It's very important that this number is zero right here because if this number was anything greater than zero, that would mean your gRNA cuts both your target gene and some other place. Here's off targets with one mismatch, two mismatches, and three mismatches. Now, while it's ideal, it's very difficult to find a gRNA that has uh, zero off targets with three mismatches. So this is permissible. It's not perfect, but it's permissible to see a, a number greater than zero in this column. But I would definitely want to avoid, let's say, this target down here, or this gRNA here, that has two off targets with only one mismatch. There's a very high chance that I would mutate um, those other sites in the genome in addition to my target gene. So anyways, that's how it's ranking these up here. Um, but you also want to uh, carefully consider each of these gRNAs. So for example, uh, I don't want to just pick the first one that's here, because if I look uh, closer, this first gRNA is actually over here in the last exon. Now, that might be okay, but in general, if you're mutating closer to the C terminus of the protein, it's less likely to introduce a loss of function mutation to that protein, right? If I'm in the last, let's say, few amino acids of a thousand amino acid protein, mutating there towards the end of it might not have enough of a destabilizing effect to completely knock out uh, that protein or prevent its translation or activity. So take this table with a grain of salt. Um, I'm actually going to go here to the second rank, which is up here in the first exon. Now that's a much better situation there. I've got a gRNA that can cut the first exon, so very close to the beginning of the protein, I can introduce a mutation there. I really, really like that. And then if I check the rest of the parameters here, <clears throat> GC content is okay. Uh, there's a self-complementarity score, which just tells you the chances that the gRNA is going to bind to itself. A score of 1 is completely fine. 3, uh, you start to, to worry about that, but it's still mostly okay. And then you can see here this gRNA has very few off targets, uh, really only has off targets with three mismatches. So this is a pretty good candidate. I'm going to click on that, and it's going to bring up this website here. that gives me more information about that gRNA. So first of all, here's the sequence of the gRNA. It includes the PAM, however. So if you're copying the sequence to order oligonucleotides, you only want the first 20 bases. You don't want to include this PAM here. You don't want those last three. So you want to copy that and save it. <clears throat> you can actually print this entire page. There's a lot of information on here that's useful uh, later. So I definitely recommend saving this as a PDF. But anyways, there's the sequence for your gRNA. 
There's also, in this table, uh, these are those primers that I was talking about that you can use to PCR amplify the target sequence um, later on to check for mutations. So each of these primers is actually shown up here on this diagram. It's showing the left primer and the right primer, for example, are going to amplify everything in between them. And there's the gRNA sequence. So there you go. I can get a nice long sequence out of these primers. It's 976 bases, actually. And my mutation is right in the middle there. So I'll get a very good sequencing read for that mutation if I use these two primers. OK. I also like to record the coordinates of those primers uh, for future reference, and that's where these are. So you can see they bind to chromosome 19 between these bases. All right, and then if we go down, uh, it actually displays what the off targets are. So, for example, this gRNA has one off target here on chromosome 10, and here's the sequence there, and the mismatches are shown in red. Now, if possible, uh, you want to select gRNAs with the mismatches as close to the 3' end here as possible, because that's the way Cas9 binds. It starts at the 3' end, and then it binds the rest of the bases. So this uh, off-target right here, first of all, it has three mismatches, so I am, I'm very skeptical that it will do anything uh, to it. But <clears throat> if it was only one mismatch, and it was one or two mismatches, and it was closer here to the end, I would feel better about that. There would be a lower risk that Cas9 would attack this sequence and cut it. All right, and then if we scroll even farther down, we see a few other statistics. These are uh, simulation models. Take them with a grain of salt, but pretty much it's trying to predict the, the probability that you'll get a frame shift mutation out of this gRNA, the cut it makes, and the corresponding fix. So here we have about a 50% chance that we're going to get a frame shift and then here would be the different types of frame shifts that you can get there. All right, so a lot of information there, um, but what you need to do is you need to copy down definitely the gRNA sequence and the sequence of these primers, the left primer and the right primer, because we use those later to validate your mutation. Okay, so I think that's everything we need from Chop Chop. Uh, we've got our gRNA, we've got our primer pair. Oh, uh, by the way, I would also recommend selecting two or more of these gRNAs. So don't just stop at one. Uh, get two gRNAs at least, and then use both of them to do a dual mutation in the gene. And then you're much more likely uh, to get a loss of function. Okay. So let's just jump back into the PowerPoint slides here. That's everything I've already talked about. And here we go. Oh, one more note. You might notice that Chop Chop estimates the melting temperature of these primers. This is a very important parameter for when you're designing the PCR reaction to copy that stretch of the genome. This TM is just an estimate, and it's actually inaccurate for the uh, type of PCR that we do. So we use a, uh, a PCR reaction, our enzyme kit from New England Biolabs. So definitely go to NEB's website and use their TM calculator to calculate that melting temperature. Do not use the melting temperature from the Chop Chop website. Once you're there at that calculator, you just need to tell it that you're using fusion polymerase and uh, HF buffer, and then it will do the rest for you. You just copy this uh, sequence into that calculator, and it'll give you a TM. Okay, so now we've got our gRNA sequence. What do we do next? Well. We have to get it into the plasmid, and there's a, we have another video on oligonealing cloning if you want to check that out real quick, um, but here's just a quick review of how that approach works. Uh, we're going to start off with our Cas9 expression plasmid that has no gRNA, but it does have two of these BBS1 restriction sites in it. So what that allows us to do is add this restriction enzyme, this BBS1, and it will cut that plasmid to open it up and leave these sticky ends here, for example, this single-stranded stretch of GTGG, and we can use those sticky ends to insert our gRNA sequence into that plasmid. So for example, uh, let's say I have my gRNA sequence here. Again, I did not add the PAM to that gRNA, um, but I'm going to append to the 5' prime end of that these bases, CACC, and those are complementary 
to GTGG. So if I put this in the same solution, CACC will bind GTGG. But we need a double-stranded uh, sequence here. We need a duplex. So we also prepare an antisense oligo. And that needs to have another sticky end here, this CAA that will bind to this GTT, then the reverse complement of that gRNA sequence. Okay. And then when I mix those oligos together, I'm going to get a duplex here. G binds to C, C binds to G, but my sticky ends are still single-stranded. So when I mix these two pieces together, they're going to bind to one another, CACC to GTGG. Then I can ligate them permanently together, and that's my plasmid. So now I have the gRNA inserted into this Cas9 expression plasmid. And I can transform that into E. coli. So just to go over that step by step, uh, let's say you've got a gRNA. This is how you design those oligos. First off, you start by designing the sense oligo. So it's going to start with a CACC. Remember, that's the sticky end. Then, if your gRNA does not contain or does not have a G on its 5' prime end, you add that here after the CACC. Then you directly copy the gRNA sequence from chop chop into the 3' prime end of that oligo. Now once again, notice here I do not have the PAM in this gRNA sequence. But there you go, that's your sense oligo. Since it didn't have a G on the 5' prime end, I added one. Then we prepare the anti-sense oligo. Similar approach, but different sticky end, so now it's AAC that I have to add there. Then I have the reverse complement of the gRNA sequence. So over here, this uh, gRNA ended GCC, so this one's going to begin CGG. Uh, here's a nice little web tool uh, for that, so you can go to this website here, reverse-complement.com, to quickly copy in this sequence and get that reverse complement. And then finally, since I added a G up here to the five prime end of this gRNA, I've got to put one. I've got to put a C down here on the three prime end of this one. All right, so that C will bind to that G. Okay. Once you've got those Legos uh, designed, I would highly suggest you put them into PowerPoint like I have here, and then flip them around just to make sure that they bind to one another. Uh, just to convince yourself that this is a good approach, all right? That these uh, G that these gRNA oligos are actually going to form a duplex. You can see here C is binding to G, C to G, but I've still got my my overhangs here, my CAA and my CACC, all right? And that's exactly uh, what you would send off uh, and order. And for just a few dollars and a few days, uh, there's a lot of different companies that will uh, ship those oligos right back to you and then you can clone them into the plasmid. So that concludes this video, but please, please, please uh, let me know if you have any questions on this process of designing the gRNAs or if you'd like me to take a look at your gRNAs just to double check them.